And welcome to the Oddity Archive, the show that thought it had it all figured out. So, here's what happened. I had the first three episodes of this new season all lined up and ready to go, and then that little COVID-19 thing kinda screwed me over and uh, thereby instantly dating this episode. But anyway, this week would have been this year's record ripoffs installment, and I would have put it out this week because I actually would have been up in Canada this week, uh, hence the box, and I would have been doing a little joint project with Ben, uh, no relation, of classical gas emissions infamy. You know, the guy that sent me that Maria tape earlier this year? Yes, despite that, we are still on speaking terms. But anyway, that project would have been next time around, and then the third episode would be episode 200. And even that's kind of in a state of flux right now. So anyway, since the Canadian border remains closed, and it's just as well because my passport never did show up in the mail anyway, I've been forced to take those little projects that I was going to do anyway over this little break and try and shoot them. I hadn't planned on shooting any of this stuff, but I kind of needed something to show for myself here. So anyway, I've got one failure, one ongoing probable failure, one possible success, and one thoroughly unremarkable presumptive success to go over today. Let's just say, if this is your first Archive episode, you might want to come back to this one much, much later. But anyway, let me get... To out of character here, and let me tell you all about how I spent my summer. Fool that I am, I only ordered one of these things, uh, not the soft box, although I guess I only have one of those as well, but I'm referring to, underneath this, a Neewer 480 LED light. And over the last year on Archive, I've been using these little Sony LED deals that can either hook to the top of the camcorder or to a separate tripod. And I've just been burning through so many batteries that it's just, it's not worth it. So I decided to give this a try. And as I am learning, and as I'm sure you've already seen, if you've seen like a Ben's junk in the last year, Things kind of have a case of flashlight syndrome. Everything looks like I'm just shining a flashlight at it. So it it's even worse here, and you will see that in uh, other parts of this episode. So I definitely need to get a second one and just work on blending stuff. Uh, not that the other lights were great on that front either, but it's uh, definitely more pronounced here. Anyway, uh, I... I think this is the same light that Tecmon uses. I am I promise I'm not trying to copy him. I actually picked this out because I was looking at some higher-end ones, but I could burn through a half dozen of these before I'd get to the cost of a big one. And the complaints about these things seem to be more for people that just didn't know what they were doing. So I'll, I'll give this a shot. I'm sure I'll just have to go ahead and order a second one of these almost right away. But anyway, uh, I guess I'll quickly demo it here. Make the rest of the room go dark. So I think that's everything at 100% right now. So let's take everything out. And uh, we'll crank up the yellow, that kind of warm, sunny thing which is kind of what Archive uh, tries to be anyway, just more of that home look. Then we can add in more white. Or we could just go kind of straight white, or I guess uh, with this thing kind of blue. So, um, you know, nothing too big or too special, but uh, it, it needed to happen. So just thought I'd go over that real quick.
Back at the old Archive HQ, I had to do everything in one room, and all my stuff was in there. I mean, I did have a storage unit, but it wasn't the kind of storage unit like uh, LGR has, where you can actually do things there. So, uh, it was always... Everything was in one place. If anything was good about it, everything was in one place. But when I came here, I opened things up to two rooms, because I finally could, finally had the space. And I kept the bedroom, obviously, and I still have to shoot my box segments in there. And then I have this room that I'm in at the moment, which is a hybrid office and uh, at the moment recording studio and just all around living room. And I installed my stereo and most of my AV gear in here as well. But I still wanted some kind of stereo set up in the bedroom, and, and just something basic, you know, a radio CD player, something I could hook my phone or an MP3 player to. And I remembered these mini stereo units from back in the 2000s, and I figured, well, that's actually probably perfect. There's less room in that bedroom, and, uh, you know, these things, they're not too recent, so they shouldn't be still considered hot and new, but not old enough to where it's retro quite yet. So, perfect. And I went on Fleabay, and as it turned out, good working ones were $300 or more. But I figured I'd look for a, a fixer-upper. And I found this guy at about, a, I'd say, a tenth of that price, minus shipping. And it's an Onkyo CR305TX, dates to 2004, and the seller was totally honest about it. He said, there is no remote, so you'll have to get one of those yourself, and there's no antenna stuff, and the CD player does not work. And I figured, fine, I can still Fleabay in a remote and some antenna stuff, and I've played with CD players before, I can probably get it working. And the CD player was completely jammed up, and I was able to get it working again per se, except the laser, you know, the thing that reads the CDs, that thing was just dead. So my short-term solution was I have a Blu-ray player nearby. I'll just use an adapter box, you know, something that connects to good old Phono, RCA, plug it in here, it'll do. And I can do that, but it's a massive inconvenience. So then it became looking for a, a parts unit or just another one of these or something similar or just the proper parts. Well, it took almost two years, but uh, a seller in Germany had the lens, the laser assembly. So I imported one of those. And I'm going to try and install it in here. And frankly, I'm a little scared at the moment because it involves a certain amount of desoldering and I think soldering as well. And anybody that's watched Archive long enough knows that soldering is not a strength of mine. So I'm going to try it anyway. And it says to use one of those wrist strap deals. So I got one of those. And let's hope for the best. Actually, just one more thing quickly before I start taking this apart. I mentioned I had to get all new antenna stuff, and I was looking at the supposedly more high-end antenna stuff, and there didn't seem to be any real difference between that and the basic cheapies, you know, like this $5 AM loop antenna. But uh, I prefer wire antennas in general, antenna, and... Uh, yeah, the whip, especially for FM, just wasn't cutting it. So for a little experiment, I just decided to tie off a, a split piece of speaker wire to it and then just run this out. I just have it tied up for neatness sake at the moment. And sure enough, it did wonders. So at least on the FM front, if you're looking for that uh, quick, easy little reception fix, just... Uh, a stripped off piece of speaker wire should help you out quite a bit.
Well, I have a little good news and a lot of bad news. The good news is the new laser assembly works beautifully. However, and as you sort of saw at the end of the repair montage, uh, I stuck a CD in and it wouldn't play. And I don't think I got that part, but the disc would not spin. Uh, something seemed to be clamped a little too tight. So I just took it back apart, loosened up uh, like the spring bits right here, and just made sure nothing was overly tight. Stuck it back in, put it back together, and then something... If I can get this mechanism out of the way. Something down in here gave. And uh, I uh, do have a flashlight. I don't know how helpful it's going to be. But if you look below this gear, you can see kind of a slot where this whole thing would go. Now that thing does double duty. So when this whole mechanism is in there, it actually sits low, deep down, when it's at rest. And then when it wants to play, the whole thing comes up. And it also takes care of the, <laughs> the disc tray, if I can get the mechanism out of the way here. But uh, when I put all this back together to try it, something down there gave. And I have not been able to dig deep enough to find it, but... This part mostly turns freely now, and the gears don't quite communicate. So I'm actually just going to admit defeat on this one. Uh, one step forward, two steps back. Now, having said that, in the end, I guess this is no worse than it was because the radio still works, inputs and outputs work, speakers work, all that. So in the end, it's no worse, but I really want a CD player. And uh, I shot all that actually yesterday as I'm doing this. So uh, when I finished, I just went on Fleabay just for the hell of it to see what the current going rate for these sorts of things were. Most of them were still in the $300 range. But there was this nice looking Denon that was only about 70 And I, they claimed it worked all the way through. It looked okay. And I figured I would just, I'd try that. I mean, I've spent probably, oh, about 110 grand total on this between the unit, the shipping, and the extra parts, and the remote, and all. So, you know, I'm just going to swap it out. And uh, I guess I'll maybe do a Ben's junk on the new one, new to me. And, uh, yeah, as I said, one step forward and two steps back. All right, just a little preliminary segment here. This is an introduction both to you and to myself for uh, what will hopefully become the Archive's new 8-track deck. This is a Pioneer Centrex RH-65. I would guess it dates to around 1978. Uh, obviously, don't quote me on that, uh, but I think that would be a, a safe-ish guess. Now, I haven't so much as tested this thing yet, uh, just for power, largely because this is one of those deals where there's no power button. So the only way you know if it works or not is if you stick a tape in there. And I'm not going to stick so much as a junker tape in here until I've looked around inside. I mean, this is really just fresh out of the box here. Um, it's still totally filthy. Uh, I'll have to splice in a picture of the lid here, but it is very badly scratched up. But uh, it is a metal lid, and it's just flat black, matte black, so uh, if I can get it functional, I may just get a can of spray paint and give it a, a new coat. Uh, unfortunately, the wood paneling's a little chewed up in spots, so I don't think there's much I can do about that, but at least what the audience would see on a given day looks to be okay. But I uh, had some, I guess you could say, requirements for the new-to-me deck, and uh, let's just go over those. Uh, one being VU meters, for both practical purposes and totally shallow purposes. 
Uh, for example, if it's one of those episodes where I'm playing a tape or a record or whatever, it would be nice for you to be able to see the VU meter doing its thing, you know, have it be just a little more lively visually. But also just on a practical level, to see what my playback levels are, see what recording levels are on those rare occasions I do that sort of thing. And um, I actually have a tape lined up for this year's record ripoffs, which I've actually done. Uh, this arrived in the mail too late for it. And uh, I really wish I could have had VU meters for it, but it, it just wasn't in the cards. Anyway, uh, aside from the VU meters, I wanted one with auto stop. And as strange as it sounds, I wanted one with Dolby. And I, I know I've kind of made fun of Dolby a few times on Archive, but that's more for cassettes. I think it gets better the higher the tape speed. And I mean, I'm explicitly referring to Dolby B here. Um, C, HX Pro, those are fine. But I do have some tapes that are Dolby encoded, so it would be nice to be able to do that. I mean, it's not a, an explicit requirement. I do have an outboard unit that I could use, but just to simplify things, uh, I'd rather keep the outboard one regularly hooked up to my reel-to-reel, -reel, just to not have to move things around. Otherwise, as I mentioned, this thing's totally filthy. It's a bit beaten up, but uh, from what I've read online, it's one of the better ones, and it's one of the more serviceable ones. Uh, apparently, Pioneer was using kind of generic parts here, so you could get generic gears, generic belts, just of the right size. So it sounds like the proprietary stuff is minimal, and I'll have to see just how fun it is when it comes to things like azimuth adjustment and uh, speed, that sort of thing. Like my old Montgomery Ward deck, I just cannot adjust the speed. So um, hopefully I can do that here. Hopefully I can get this tuned up, but I just wanted to take a quick look at it here. And uh, let's take a cut here and we'll take a look inside. Well, I'm pretty sure this thing's never been cleaned first off. But otherwise, just really on a superficial level here, everything looks about right. Uh, no bulging or burst caps, no stains on the circuit board. Uh, I did notice that uh, this is the counter belt here. There's a bit of a ripple in it. I don't know if it'll show up on camera, but I guess that'll have to be replaced. It does not advance when I turn it by hand, but it may be something to do with not having a tape in there. Maybe there's a cracked gear down in here. Only time will tell. Uh, but mostly it's just gunk. Um, I Like I said, I don't think this thing's ever been cleaned. So I guess I'll just stick the lid back on here. We'll turn it over, take off the bottom, and we'll try and find that drive belt. Well, this makes me happy. The belt has not turned to goo. It's a little loose. It's a little ripply, but I think it's good enough to test. And so I, I will replace it. And when that time comes, it looks like it's just being held down by this bracket with a single screw and then a slot deep down in there. So uh, hopefully that'll be a nice easy fix when the time comes. So yeah, I think I'm good to clean this sucker out and throw a tape in there just to make sure that it's basically functioning. Well, this is definitely in the upper tier of most dirty items I've ever tried to clean up. But nonetheless, I guess it's uh, time for that little moment of truth. And given the amount of gunk, uh, I'm not feeling as optimistic as I should, but hopefully that's just me being cynical. So I'm going to set the microphone down, pop in the tape, and I've got headphones going from the stereo right now so I can gauge it. Uh, I don't really have anything YouTube friendly in my test tapes, so... Uh, you might just have to take my word for it, or maybe I'll just hold the headphone up just for a split second. But anyway, uh, let me put the mic down and let's try this. Okay, 
I have hiss. I got a lot of hiss. I'm hearing something that's very slow and very warbly. Hey, I got sound. And I totally forgot that somebody recorded over my Spike Jones tape. Yeah, so there's a definite speed issue to look into. It might be a belt thing. Who knows, but I guess it's uh, semi-alive. Well, I've got to be honest. I'm just about ready to throw this unit in the trash and just try a different one because, it, just like the Onkyo, I fix one thing and two other things go. So in this case, I did not notice during the initial test that the switcher head, just the head and its uh, switching mechanism, were not uh, changing. So we were not, even though the lights were working accordingly, we weren't actually going through programs one through four. And so I uh, tried to clean it up with it in place and it just wasn't happening. So I had to take the whole mechanism apart, clean off all the old lube, <laughs> lube, which is more like glue at this point, and just completely redo it, put it back together, and it's out of alignment now, but that's fixable. But I'm still having some contact issues and uh, speed issues and stuff, and I still don't know if that's a belt thing or if I've got some sort of real power problem. But also, to make matters worse, uh, this is the program selector here. Like clockwork, just after I put in the new tape and I was just cycling through the programs to make sure everything was working, this, which is a plastic piece, just gave. It, its time had come. So this is actually a hybrid of the original piece, plastic glue, and duct tape. Very cut down duct tape. So it works again. But the whole point of this piece of plastic is just to make these little pieces of metal contact each other. That's all it is. So, a little bit of over-design there, I guess. But anyway, um, let me try and put in a tape here. We'll put in the uh, one YouTube-friendly one I've got. How dare you record over Spike Jones? I like Spike Jones. But uh, I guess it'll make for a good random cassette, or I guess random 8-track candidate someday. But uh, let's see if I can show this properly. You have to hit it just right, because if you go all the way with it, it just kind of comes to a stop. So you have to pull it out just a little to make it work. And I've got it through headphones right here. And it's just kind of random uh, junk. Uh, there was a bit where they were singing Jingle Bells, but obviously I can't uh, rewind an 8-track. Singing the National Anthem. Nice and reverent. So, I don't know, I guess maybe I'll swap out the belts just for the hell of it, but I'm thinking there's a greater issue here, because I don't think it should be doing that, and I have a hard time clearing the entry into the machine, and when you do, then, weirdly, you can move it all around. It makes absolutely no sense. So, uh, I think this is going back in the repair pile. One thing I wanted to get done during the between-season break 
was try to do at least one new song for my little ongoing incidental music project. Uh, although new arrangement of an old song would be more the case here. So if you've watched Archive long enough, uh, certainly any episodes with repair montages, uh, today's episode notwithstanding, you've probably heard a little folk instrumental called The Battle at Elderbush Gulch. And I recorded that thing back in early 2004. But uh, that song was not initially intended to be a folk piece. Uh, I actually intended it to be mostly electric, but I demoed it acoustically just because it was convenient and decided I liked it and decided to run with that for the final version. But after covering it on the pertinent Ben's Music career episode... It started to crawl up my ass a little, and I figured, well, the time is right to take a new crack at this one. But, of course, I can't leave well enough alone, so not only did I go electric with this one, I went cinematic with it. I mean, it was named after a 1913 film called The Battle at Elderbush Gulch, uh, which is in the public domain. You can go find it on archive.org and uh, keep your historian hat on if you decide to watch that one. Just saying. But anyway, I'm off topic here. I need to give extra special thanks to Nick Bertling, uh, a.k.a. one-man power pop outfit Bertling Noise Laboratories, because he took the drum duties on this one. And as such... It's the first song I've done in a little over a decade with a second person on it. But anyway, I'm going to close things out here with a nice long excerpt from that one, and I'll be sure to have a link somewhere to the full song. But otherwise, that is it for today. Uh, join me next time when it's going to be a Ben's Junk, but after that... It's going to be time for our annual banquet of slightly misshapen pop classics. Emphasis on sick. Right, Cherry? Right, Cherry? Right, Cherry?